Welcome back to another issue. I'm Red. It is I, Shino Brando. And today we're joined by Dr. Jim to chat some Pride history. Dr. Jim, how are you? I'm doing very well today here in South Florida. Hot as Dickens, but it it doing well. <laughs> so Dr. Dr. Jim here has some personal experience with Pride and Pride history. So during our Pride Month, we figured it'd be a great idea to bring him aboard. I'm here and ready to answer any questions you have for me. I'll start the show then. Uh, I'll start with the first question. He says, Red over here informed me about who we're talking to. And I was like, you know, we, it's not every day we get like modern day heroes from, from an era where, you know, there was a lot of pushback to a certain lifestyle. So is there anything from, you know, from the beginning of the movement that people don't know that we should know? It was a lot more fun than you would think. Really not. Um, people still had a good time. I mean, yeah, there was always the threat of police you know, brutalizing us. Right. But that was actually more before me, like people who would now be in their late 70s and 80s, that, you know, they had to wear handkerchiefs in the back of their pockets. You know, the hanky code was actually not for the leather community. It was for anybody who couldn't say I'm gay because they didn't know what the other person was gay or straight. So they would wear hankies or keychains on the left or the right side. And each had different meanings. And obviously that's before my time. So I don't know too much about it. Right. But my cousin who is in his 80s used to tell me what it was like being so afraid that when you went anywhere, the only way you could signal somebody to let them know that you were gay was to either have a hanky or a, a keychain or something on the left or the right pocket. It was really a very extravagant thing to do back then. You couldn't go to a gay bar and say, oh, I'm gay, or yeah, let's go home. You couldn't do that because you didn't know if it was a policeman. Right, wow. Uh, wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, I mean, to live under like surveillance and then have to live under subterfuge, right? Like you have to hide it and then have to like give off a signal just to show off like, you know, you're, you're, you're one of them or, you know, you're safe is, you know, it's, it's truly, it's a scary thought, right? It's, it's outstanding actually. It's nuts. But you know, they still, again, I have to speak in the third person because that was before me. Yeah. But they managed to have a good time. They had these little gatherings in people's homes and societies. Don't forget there was the only technology they had was a phone to call people up. There was no answering machines. There was nothing. So if you missed that person's call, that was it. Unless they called you back and they were all landlines back then. They had no cell phones. But again, this is what was told to me because it was before me. That I have no personal experience with. We had met in the uh, the comment section of a TikTok, which is just wild. Speaking of technology, hey. Yes. <laughs> about somebody wanting to remove one of the letters from the LGBTQIA+. Yes. I don't know who needs to hear this. Pride was actually started by a trans. Not only a trans woman. Pride was started by a black trans female drag queen. You want to say drop the T of the LGBTQIA+. Plus, honey, it's a rainbow flag for a solid reason. They wanted it to be a rainbow because it represents all colors, all religions, all people can be queer. Marsha P. Johnson is the mother of pride. She threw that stone when police were trying to tell her and her friends that men can't wear makeup and they need to wash their faces in dirty toilets and mop buckets. She said no. She threw a brick through a window at the Stonewall Inn, started a riot, and the next year, the first ever Pride happened in New York City, and now it happens worldwide, then you baby. You mentioned your origins with Martha P. Johnson. Would you care to speak about that? Well, I knew them both. I knew Marsha and Sylvia. And what I didn't mention in the chat in TikTok is because, you know, you have like these four little lines that you could write, and that's it. I also knew Craig Rodwell. And he, oh yeah, he also was in that riot. Now, I don't know in what capacity, but I used to work in his bookstore on Christopher Street. Now, when I say bookstore, I mean real books, not the bookstores where guys went to relieve themselves, either with other men or to go into little, the little booths. Right. But I used to work in the Christopher Street bookstore on Christopher Street for Craig. And at that point, I didn't even know he was in the riot until one day... I said something sassy and he said, you know, you have to be, you have to be really careful how you speak to your elders. I says, I'm sorry. I says, I was just joking. He says, well, you don't joke with somebody that was in the goddamn riot. Whoa. And I'm like, so I said, wow. what? And of course me being a kid, what riot are you talking about? He goes, 
the riot that caused all of this to happen in the village. I went, oh, wow. I had no idea. You had no idea you were in the presence of celebrity. No, nope, no clue. He was just this average guy. He wore jeans. He had glasses. You know, he was, you know, gray haired then. He was starting to get gray. And he was just an older guy that owned the Christopher Street bookshop. It never dawned on me that he was one of those kids along with Marsha and Sylvia. I had no clue. What was meeting Marsha and Sylvia like? Oh, my God. Uh... Well, where do I start with that? <laughs> uh, Marsha seemed like huge, like she seemed like six foot 10. She was so tall and thin. Mm -hmm. And the one thing you noticed about her, she always had makeup. At least when I saw her, she was out, she had her little purse. She always had some kind of headdress. It was either a hat with flowers or just flowers with a band around her head. I mean, she... She, she looked like she spent so much time throwing those flowers together in an arrangement on her head. And I'd never seen that before because, you know, they, back then they were called drag queens. They still are. But, you know, they were, they were called transvestites. I personally had never heard the word transgender when I was a teenager. But all I would hear is, oh, yeah, she's, she's the transvestite that beat up the cops. And I looked, I looked and I went, well, she's like six foot 10. Of course she beat up the cops. <laughs> yeah, no <laughs> doubt. That, did, that didn't surprise me at all. Now, Sylvia was shorter, but man, did that, that girl had a mouth on her and she'd go into Spanish and English at the same time. And when she started cursing you, you just wanted to get the hell out of the way. <laughs> she was a spitfire. Mm -hmm. Holy Jesus. They hung out in the village and many times Sylvia would go off and she spent more time, I think, it, I believe it was the East Village. Marsha was more in the West Village where I hung out. And she used to hang out in a store called the Village Lighting that was on Hudson Street, maybe 150 feet north of Christopher. And we used to hang out in there. And I used to, in looking back on it, you know, Harvey Milk had his little storefront in San Francisco where the people would get together. Yeah. Well, the East Coast version was Randy Wicker's store on Hudson Street that the people would get together and he would plan protests and marches. Randy, I consider an unsung hero. He's still alive, by the way. He's in his 80s. Maybe he not. lives in New Jersey. And his partner died from AIDS back when there was no medicine. And he would form rallies and protests and he would get the uh, papers and posters and go to the store and have them Xeroxed. And he would do all of that. He was a fierce activist. You didn't mess with that man. And I was just looking at some pictures of him recently. And he's aged, but he still looks like Randy. And Marsha was his roommate. Marsha Johnson moved in with him oh, yeah. until she died. Yes, until she yeah. died. And by the way, I want to say this publicly. I don't care what the cops say. She mm -hmm. did not kill herself. She was murdered, period unequivocal, no apologies. They didn't even bother doing a thorough investigation because she was, as they used to say back then, a tranny. Yeah. It's insulting, you know, but that's the word that they used. I'm glad you brought that up because I was actually going over some history over that too. And I, when that came across that, I was just immediately my mind went to that's that's an obvious murder. There's there's no way about it. And, and the fact that they ignored the entire investigation, it's super insulting. I, I continued reading that. I believe they're trying to reopen the investigation, I, I hear. Yes. Right on. But you know, here's the thing. I was there. I just happened to be there. I believe it was a Tuesday afternoon. I happened to have been there when they found her body. Oh, no. And wow. Randy, I went to Randy's store because I hung out in the store, not in the summer because it was so damn hot you stayed outside because he would keep the lights on, which was great in the winter when you wanted to get out of the cold. You went into Randy's store, but in the summer, oh, my God, <laughs> it was like a thousand degrees in that damn store. <laughs> But he put the air conditioner. I says, Randy, do you have to put all the lights on? He'd say, how do you expect me to sell the lights if they're not on? I have to show the people that the lights are working. So he leaves them on. And the, the storefront had a big window facing Hudson, which was, again, as I said, about 150 feet north of Christopher. And so he'd keep them on and we'd stay outside. So I went in the store and he says, they found Marsha. They found Marsha. And I went, uh, well, where is she? She's in the water. She's dead. She's dead. They killed her. They killed her. That's all he kept saying. So I didn't go down to where they were. I just 
didn't want to, I didn't, no, didn't want to see it. He went down there and he locked up the store. I said, no, I'm not going to stay in this store with a thousand degrees. I said, lock up the store. I'll stay in front of the store. It's cooler outside. So they, he comes back like 20 minutes later and he goes, we're going to get a protest together. I mean, he used to do things like that on the fly. Mind you, no technology, no Facebook, no Zoom. He says, I'm going to get the posters out. I'm going to put them on the lampposts and the streetlights and, and I'm going to make phone calls. And again, by that point, I think they may have had answering machines, I think. But there was some large protests about that because the, the cops of the 6th precinct on West 10th Street didn't do diddly squat. That's right. Yeah. And we protested. And then we did protests for Randy's partner who I met him only twice. He was dying when I met him. He must have weighed 80 pounds soaking wet. And Randy wow. said to me, he doesn't have much time left. And what, what, could, you, what could I say? The, you know, I, I, there's no words to make somebody feel better when he said he's, he knew what was going on. And so then there was some kind of protest about that because I was in the village practically every weekend, but I lived in Brooklyn. I didn't live in Manhattan, but I used to come into Manhattan because, you know, in Brooklyn being gay back then, it wasn't exactly... Uh, a fantastic treat. Whereas in the village, I felt very comfortable being with my people. They were always my people. And here's what's really crazy. I didn't find the racism that I see now. I, I, I didn't see that. Remember, the log cabin Republicans formed in the 80s mm -hmm. as a watchdog for the gay community to make sure that the Republicans weren't pulling crap on us. So they formed the log cabin Republicans, not necessarily to be a part of the Republican Party, but to keep a watch. What happened in these last 35 years? I don't know. But we have more problems now with racism and log cabin Republicans not liking the transgender community and white privilege. We never had white privilege back then. We were all together. Marsha was black. Sylvia was Latin. I hung out with them. I didn't go, oh, she's black. Oh, she's Latino. You were all together fighting for the same thing. And it seems like now we're all into these seg segmented groups. Uh, in New York City, they're having problems between pride going back to its roots and heritage of pride. You can't even get two pride organizations together anymore because one is corporately sponsored and the other one wants to get back to its roots the way it was back in the 70s. I don't get it. Yeah, I you... don't get it either. As yeah, far as I'm concerned, pride is a celebration of people that were repressed and had to hide who they are. Correct. And corporations being a part of that or police being a part of that, in my personal opinion, need to get the fuck out. You see, that's what the pride getting back to its roots is. That is now a separate entity from heritage of pride, which now, I mean, I'm going to speak very frankly because that's Please how do. I am. And I don't give a shit who hears it or who cares. Please do. We yeah, swear on the show all the time. Go for it. Go ahead. Good. <laughs> now, tell me what storm windows have to do with pride. Tell me what Wells Fargo Bank has to do with pride or closet organizers or hurricane windows since I live in Florida. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to tell me what all these organizations have to do with pride. And is Heritage of Pride certain that every single one of these corporations donates to gay and lesbian causes or do they donate against gay and lesbian causes? They just show up at our events Take yeah, our they just put on the rainbow donates. shirt and go, hey, look at us. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. then donates and says, ha ha, we screwed you out of $10,000, you stupid queens. That's the problem. So I'd like to know if the corporation is pride friendly. Like, let's say MTV shows up. MTV is for us a thousand percent. I have no problem at MTV putting a booth and showing up. Right. But if Chick-fil-A showed up and wanted money from us, would They're Heritage need Pride want them? I can tell you that they're going to need storm windows because I'm going to throw a brick through them. <laughs> That's my point. So what I told Heritage of Pride, I said, so if Chick-fil-A said, oh, we don't give any money to hate groups anymore. They show up at Pride and they're charging you $5 to get a chicken sandwich. And then you find out two months later that all that money went to anti-gay establishments and anti-gay causes. You as Heritage of Pride would be happy to have let them come in without doing your due diligence and checking them out. Right. They don't check the corporations. That's where my problem is. I'm a researcher. My, I am published in my field in the Journal of AIDS and Clinical Research. I'm not talking out of my ass. Right. So if you're going to let a corporation have a booth, do some research. 
They've had four years of donating to AIDS organizations. Oh, they've had three years donating to transgender organizations. Okay, this is great. We want them with us. Right. But if you go into the research and you see, oh, like Barilla Pasta. Remember that whole thing that the guy from Barilla Pasta wants nothing to do with gay people? Would yeah, you let Barilla Pasta march in your parade simply because you want the corporate sponsorship and the money? Knowing that, not. that's my point. So where are these people checking the corporations to see that their history is inclusive rather than segregated? I will not even have you in my house. If you use any racist term, you do not come into my house, period. I do not hang out with you. I read an amazing book by Dr. Ibram Kendi, K-E-N-D-I, called How to Be an Anti-Racist. He gives you the history of racism. He's an African-American man. I had the pleasure of speaking with him and seeing him on a Zoom meeting. The man is absolutely brilliant. That's the kind of people I want in my life. So don't give me the crap that, well, we needed the money, you know, we're going to, we're going to end up going in the red. Well, go in the red, but do it honestly and with integrity. It yeah, doesn't yeah. matter if in, you go in the red, if you're doing everything above board. Absolutely. In the origins of the riot and, you know, all of those events start off by going in the red. You spent money to get them mm -hmm. printed. You spent time and energy. They operated in the red as it is. Exactly. The fact that you have an opportunity to make money on this, you start to become great. You're no longer on the side in which you want to be anymore. You know, I wrote a very strong, I'm a letter writer. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I'm a researcher and I love writing. In fact, in my classes, I told my teacher, never give me free reign with my work because I'll give you a thousand pages. <laughs> and he said to me, I don't want to read it. Okay, the assignment is six pages. I don't want any more than six pages. I said, that's exactly what you need to tell me because I'll just keep going on. Aye, aye, Captain. So <laughs> I wrote, I don't want to say the wrong organization, but I will just give, you could probably find the history of it very quickly, even while we're on the program. It was an organization in March of 2020 that sponsored the winter party in Miami Beach, Florida. 48 people got COVID. One of my friends died, who was mm -hmm. one of the volunteers. Now, this was in March of 2020, several days before they put the lockdown. You mean to tell me as a gay organization, you didn't do your due diligence to find out this virus was coming here and to shut the event down before you did it? But you got the money. You did the damn party. Did you pay for any of the funerals of the four people who died? Did you pay any of the medical expenses of the people who got sick? I don't think so. You got your money, though. Well, gay right. organization, but I'm not going to quote the wrong one. Yeah, I don't remember which one, but it was the major sponsor of the Winter Party in March of 2020. That I can tell you, because my friend was a volunteer. And again, I'm not mentioning names because I want to give his family privacy. But he died of COVID, and he was at least 10 to 15 years younger than me. Wow. So, And this was at the very beginning, when yeah. they thought, oh, only elderly people got this. Young people don't have to worry. Well, we found out that's not true, because right. lots of young people died. It's true, yeah. So... I need to know that if you're going to come into my house, if I'm going to march in your event, I got to know that you don't have a history of racism, transphobia, bigotry. I need to know that because well, I'm not marching with you because my name is important. You know, my father mm -hmm. used to tell me you're born with your name and that's the only thing you die with is your name. And my parents both lived. My mother was 96 and my father was 90. They both lived very old. Right so yeah. if you have to go through life wondering if you made a mistake, well, do a little research. That's what the internet is there for. I can yeah. find out anything on the internet. So if I want to find out about Dr. John Smith or Dr. Jane Doe, all I got to do is go on the internet. I'm not going to do any research with you if you're a bigot. Right. Right. And that's, and that's not doing where it. We where we no, I mean, find a, a great honor of having you on our show. Not yeah. only did you go to school in your profession, you are a well-spoken person in the community and I, you don't put up with shit. You know something? And people say it's because I'm older. And I said, no, I was like this in my 20s. What you see now is what you saw then. You know, I went to, when George Floyd was massacred, it wasn't murdered. The guy was massacred, massacred like a yeah. dog. Right. And Thank I you. went to one of the protests in Fort Lauderdale. And I was one of the few non-people of color. And they all were looking at me. And one guy comes over to me, goes, do you feel uncomfortable? I said, no, why should I feel uncomfortable? I didn't do anything to anybody. I'm here to stand with you. I said, this is your home and this is my home. These people need to be held accountable and I'm here to help you. The guy 
started crying and hugged me, yeah. wouldn't let me go. And he has his girlfriend. He goes, I'm going to leave my girlfriend with her friends. Can I march with you with my arm around you? I said, I would be insulted if you didn't. 10-4. Right and he, I, straight guy. And I said, no. I, he goes, and he called me dad. I said, <laughs> I'll be your dad. I said, you need anything? You want some water? I'll get you water. I said, I'll be your dad. I said, I'm everybody's dad. So, you know, let's march together. I said, you don't want your girlfriend to march? He said, no, I want to have you all to myself. I said, I'm with you. That's fine. <laughs> and, you know, today, like I was going to ask for, like in your in your years going, like, have you seen, like, have you seen any real progress compared to like the amounts of negativity you've seen around the world? Yes, I have seen progress. I mean, the one thing that shocked me the most was marriage equality. I like blown away from that. I never in my lifetime expected to see that. And the election of Obama, I never expected to see that. Yeah, that surprised me too. <laughs> that, and Kamala Harris, I ne oh my God. So we are moving. We mm -hmm. are, you know, even if the train moves two miles an hour, it's still moving forward. It doesn't have to go lightning speed. As long as it's moving and you're not in the same place where you were, that means you're evolving. Even if you're evolving slow, it don't matter. The yeah, speed right. doesn't matter. It's the direction you're pointed. No, no, it's a marathon, not a race. I get you. Amen. You know, I lived in New York City. In fact, I'm going back to New York at the end of the month to move mm -hmm. up there for six months. And I'll be, the first time I'll be living in Manhattan, which I'm very excited about. Because again, I'm from Brooklyn. And if you can hear the accent, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> just a little bit, yeah. Just, yeah, just, just slightly. Yeah. But when I, go, when I go back to New York and I see my family, the accent gets thicker. So I used to hang out with Vito Russo, the celluloid closet. I knew Tom of Finland. Mm. I knew the guy who created the, the gay pride flag, Gilbert Baker. Marvelous man, character, another character. And most people, you know, our, our little, like our baby gays don't understand that the first flag had eight stripes and then the second flag had seven. And the one that we have now has six. And I always tell them, you need to learn your history because if you don't, you don't know which direction to move. It has nothing to do with, I'm trying to, you know, tell you what to do, but you need to know your history so you know what to do for yourself. I'm not going to tell you anything because my journey and yours are different. We could be the same age and our journeys are different. So I'm not going to tell you what you should do on your journey, but I'm going to tell you to be informed so that you can make a good decision on which direction you wish to go in. Mm -hmm. Just always move forward. I am very happy to hear you say that. Well, let's, let's not forget back in the seventies, when that flag was created, there was no AIDS. It's yeah. true. I say to people, I'm ancient. I'm from the before time. Yeah. <laughs> And what people don't know, I'm going to give you a little tidbit that very few people realize. The first case may have been reported on June 5th, 1981. I can tell you fact that people were dying in 1977. Really now? Yes. As a very young man, I was a very precocious, mischievous <laughs> person. And sometimes I did things that were, you know, I, my parents never found out. That's okay. <laughs> It you is know, what it had, is. You had ladies of the evening and I was one of the kids of the evening. There you go. Understood. And uh, I like to say it that way, especially <laughs> at my age. And I remember the other guys on Christopher Street, you know, two, three in the morning in the summer. And one was showing me the marks on the arm. And they were the KS lesions, but I didn't know what it was. I was barely 22. And he's like, look at that. And I touched them because he goes, you think it was a bruise from a rough trick? And I touched him and I said, wait a minute, a bruise is not raised. This was raised like maybe an eighth of an inch higher than the rest of his skin. I said, it looks like almost like a scab. So I said, did you cut yourself? Did you fall? Did somebody try to burn you? No, Jim, nothing. I don't understand this. Well, he was dead in three weeks. Oh my God. Wow. And then others, you know, you're, you're in the street. You know, I had a place to live. Some of these kids didn't. Like the people in the Stonewall Riot, they didn't have real places to live. Or they lived six, six, six together in one room. And of course, the right. rents were a lot cheaper back then. Yeah. So th these guys would come, oh, you know, I've got, I've got this, uh, this, I feel like I can't breathe. I feel like I can't breathe. And I'm like, you know, were you running? Or were you smoking? You know, smoking, we knew even back then it wasn't the best thing to do. And he goes, no, Jim, I can't. It's like I cough and I can't catch my breath and the little blood comes out. And I went to the doctor and he gave me medicine for bronchitis, but I'm not getting better. It was the pneumocystis pneumonia. They didn't check on those kids because they were kids. They were street kids. So they went to the health department and they got minimal health care. You know, here's a pill. But they were dying of AIDS, but nobody knew it.
And when it happened, the first friend that I actually lost, I think was, now again, this is my memory going back a long time. I would say 1984 or 85. And it was so eerie because I remembered the kids in the street and these guys had the same things that those kids had. But again, I'm a kid. I didn't put two and two together. I became part of uh, GMHC. It used to be, no Gay Men's Health Crisis used to be known as Gay Men's Health Initiative before HIV. And then they changed the name to Gay Men's Health Crisis and it was Gay Men's Health Emergency and all these things. And I joined, they had the very first, the first of its kind ever large scale study of gay sex. And that I believe was in 1986. And then they, it was the 500 men study or the 600 men study. You could look this up or was it the 800 men? It was 800 men and then 500 men. And I was in both parts. Wow. Well, it seems that all the people in my classes are dead, except oh me, my wow. even my teachers. I lost personally over 100 friends. And I, I, I went to therapy for years for survivor's guilt. And it was very difficult. I still, like, I watched the last couple of episodes of Pose. I couldn't sleep that night at all. I, I just couldn't sleep. People don't understand when you take one pill a day now compared to the way it was. And the people that have had the virus that are alive after 25 and 35 years are having major health problems from the medications they took and the length of the virus. You see, the one thing people forget is if you became positive 10 years ago, let's say it's 2010 and you find out, oh my, I have HIV. Oh, I'll take one pill. You don't know how your DNA is going to react as the virus stays in your system for 20, 30, 40 years. I have a friend who's had it. He's had three strokes, a heart attack and cancer. Oh I had another well, friend who had cancer three times and finally died, 59 years old. So to say to me, well, I don't care if I get HIV because it's not going to kill me. No, it won't. It's not going to do to you what it did to my friends back then. But do you know what's going to happen to you in 20 years after having this virus? You see, I'm getting older, but I'm HIV negative. So I'm just having the little aches and pains of getting older. I don't wake up every morning thinking, oh my God, I'm taking this medication and I'm exhausted and I've got diarrhea. And yet people are still having side effects. To say that nobody's having side effects, nobody's having any problems is incorrect. The one thing that is correct, if you're undetectable, you cannot pass the virus. Undetectable right. equals untransmissible. Right. That's a message that the gay community still doesn't get. There's still a lot of stigma. My dissertation was on HIV stigma, HIV positive men and resilience. So I did research on this topic and it got published. Hell yeah. And in fact, the APA, the American Psychological Association, has accepted my work two years in a row for a poster at their convention. Well, congratulations. And, uh, I actually congratulations. got, thank you. I actually got into a meeting at the United Nations based yeah. on my work. Wow, even more congratulations That's on that. absolutely amazing. And I did it for them. You want to know something? I, I, I run away from the spotlight. I don't want it. I did it for my friends that I couldn't save. I did it for my friends that I couldn't help. I watched them die in front of my face, no more than two feet away from me. And, you know, that was hard. You're not supposed to be losing your friends in your 20s and 30s. You're not supposed no. to be having everybody die on you. I went to one week in 1992. I lost a friend on December 7th, or December 9th, and December 25th. Oh my God. Three young men. And so we pulled some some groups of people uh, across the uh, the LGBTQIA. And so some of their questions include, as an OG queer, someone who had to actually fight to be who you are, how do you feel about like biphobia and erasure that way? I have to be honest with you, I hate labels. I don't, if you tell me you want to date me, but then you tell me I'm bisexual and I also like dating women, I'll say, that's fine. I said, obviously, there are things in a woman that I can't give you. Mm -hmm. right, and right. there are things with her that she can't give you. Mm -hmm. So, and you're obviously very comfortable in your skin with both. So who the hell am I to tell you what to do? I don't have an issue with it. I don't know if that is standard in the gay community. That's not a subject we, I just don't talk about. It's like, I've been intimate with trans people because it's like, I'm more interested in you, not your genitals. I don't care about your genitals. Right. They, yeah. Do they work? Will, <laughs> will I be able to enjoy them regardless of what they look like? Can I enjoy them? Will you enjoy me? Then that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. that, that's simply the way I look at it. We're people for God's sake. We all bleed red. 
I don't look at people and go, oh, well, you know, he's, oh, he's got yellow skin. He's a, oh, look at his eyes. He's Asian. Oh, wow. He's, he's really dark. Oh my God. Well, okay. He's dark. Okay. He's got more melanin in his skin than I do. And that means, tell right. me what that means, please. Right. Exactly. I don't, I don't, und- I'm sorry. I just don't get it. Mm-hmm. I have never understood that because if you're nice to me, I don't care if you weigh 400 pounds. If you're a nice person, I want you in my life. I will say uh, here in the local community, that is something that is very stigmatized when like a body image and less of an attitude that is just starting to now be a thing of, you know what, if you run your mouth like you're a train, we're going to treat you like one and you can keep going that way. Mm -hmm. I like that. I'm going to use that. Go for it. I'm going to use it. Yeah, I don't I don't see the problem why people in our community that is already highly stigmatized turns around and stigmatizes other people in the community because they don't look a certain way. Right. That's that's a big issue I have. Yeah, that relates to our our next audience question was how do you keep fighting when the entire world is full of like bigots and hatred that way? It's how very do you simple. find the courage to keep fighting that way. Oh my God, that's that's really easy. Random acts of kindness. Yeah. For instance, I'll give you some examples. This was when I was in New York. I was on Christopher Street. It was January. It was 20 degrees, maybe 15. My friend owned a store in Manhattan called New York Body Works. No longer there, but I used to go to the store and I was leaving the store and this guy was homeless, this young gay kid, and he had no shoes and socks on. I went, what are you doing? He says, somebody stole my shoes and socks. Right there, I took off my shoes and socks, put them on his feet. I said, man, my my feet are nice and warm. I said, lean against the building. I'll put the socks on you, put the shoes on him. And he goes, but now you're you're barefoot. I says, I'm going back to my friend's store and I'm buying some socks and shoes. That's what I did. That doesn't make me special. There was a homeless African-American woman. You could see there were, there were mental issues there. She went up and she was counting her change to get something from Arby's. Mm-hmm. And I just went up and I said, oh no, your money's no good here. And I said to the people behind the counter, I said, whatever she wants, get. And I said, ma'am, get food for now and then get food for later. And she looked at me, I said, your money is no good. I'm paying for everything. You hold that for another time. I and I just you. paid for three meals worth of food. Bless there you. was a veteran by the World Trade Center before Mm 9-11. And it was, again, a very cold night. And I was coming home. I may have been at one of the bars in the village. And I was driving down the West Side Highway. And I wanted to take the tunnel to go into Brooklyn. Rather than take the Brooklyn Bridge, I'd get home quicker. It was so cold. And he had no food. And I had food on me. And I, I gave him my winter jacket. I put it out the window, gave him my gloves, and I gave him the food. He goes, oh, my God. And he started crying. I said, don't cry. Thank you for your service. We need to start being kind to each other. I didn't know what his political affiliation was. I didn't Mm -hmm. care. The man was freezing. That gay kid was freezing. It had nothing to do with political affiliation. I don't care if he was red, brown, green, or purple. He needed help. What is the big deal of helping somebody who's in trouble? Somebody in the community needs to explain to me what the hell is the big deal about helping someone in trouble. We turn our backs on everybody. We Your turn words. our backs on our own people. Let me see, I'm trying to think of people that I knew in the community that are, you know, Vito Russo was a character. He created the movie, The Celluloid Closet that he narrated and he wrote a book. I went to a show in New York. I love off, 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 off Broadway where it's like $8 for a ticket. <laughs> and I met who was the narrator, Quentin Crisp. I met him and I got his autograph. And I told him, I said, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making my life possible. At the time, he had to have been in his 70s. He lived to 94. He was in World War I and he wore very, what people would say, feminine clothes. You know, he'd wear makeup and boas around his neck and big Easter bonnet type hats. Right here. <laughs> Look him up. Quentin Crisp. Q-U-E-N-T-I-N. Quentin Crisp. C-R-I-S-P. He was, oh God, I can't think. He, there was a very famous movie that came out about 30 years ago that he, that's how he became famous. When he told his life story as a young guy in world, during World War I in England. I can't remember. Oh God. Look it up. It's just Google his name. I can't think of the movie. But it's got to be out there somewhere and you could probably get it. 
But the movie was how he was made fun of, how he was beaten, spit on, you know, the things that happened in England during maybe 1920. And I got, I had the pleasure of meeting this man. Phenomenal. My God, I've been so lucky and so privileged because I never wasted an opportunity. And I, I want to tell all your listeners, don't waste an opportunity. Sometimes that door only opens once. The same thing with Tom of Finland, who is a big guy in the leather s and community. He is the guy who drew pictures of men with exaggerated penises and exaggerated mm-hmm. big giant muscles. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I met him. He took me to lunch. Right on. <laughs> I was at the local beach in Brooklyn. And I remember thinking, oh, my God. Tom of Finland is at the Different Light bookstore in the village. I put my clothes on, shorts, tank top, ran all the way into the city with my car, got there, parked the car, ran into the bookstore, and I was the last one online. I got his autograph too, by the way. And I believe that was 1988, three years before he died. Mm -hmm. And I went up to him and I I was the last on the row, last one in the line. And he calls me in front of these other men who are all dressed in full leather. And he said in his Norwegian or Finnish or Swedish accent, and he says, I don't know why everybody's trying to impress me. You're the only one that's dressed like a normal person. Your weather is too damn hot in New York City. (laughs) So I said, well, Mr. Mr. Tom, he goes, oh, no, no, it's Tom. Please call me Tom. So I said, okay, Tom. I said, I'd like to have my book that I'm purchasing here autographed. He says, I'll do better than that. I'll sign the book if you have lunch with me. Right on. I said, um, okay. Uh, And all the guys are looking at me like they want to kill me. All these guys, (laughs) here I am, this little boy from Brooklyn, dressed in a tank top and little Butana whore shorts (laughs) with the socks, with the stripes on the socks that go around the sock and the sneakers. And they're all dressed, pictured harnesses, full leather, chaps. And here I am, dressed like I came from the beach. And he took me out to lunch and we had this wonderful conversation. I said, why did you draw these? He says, well, I never thought anybody would be stupid enough to try and imitate them. (laughs) (laughs) He says, these guys are doing all these modifications and things to their bodies to try and get big. He says, you're not supposed to have a penis that goes down to your knees. He says, you're not supposed to have a penis that big. And yet they're using all these devices to make them bigger. He said, they're not supposed to do that. I did this as a slap in the face to society for people who didn't want to look at men, that there was something wrong with looking at the nude male figure, but it was perfectly okay to see a woman with her tits out. Yeah. But it was something bad to see a man with a bulge between his legs. Right, right, right. I agree. And that's why he did the drawings. And we talked about his partner and he started to cry. He says, I'll never be with anybody else. Mm -hmm. And he wasn't. And if you have a chance, go see the movie. I don't remember the name, but I did see the movie. Tom, I think it's in Tom, the biography of his life. Mm. I can tell you this, that man who played Tom of Finland could have been his twin. He <laughs> spoke like him. He smoked like him. His mannerisms, I don't know who he studied because that movie came out in maybe 2016, 2015, 2017. But I'm telling you right now, he got Tom of Finland down pat. Perfect. Question for you. For the march, you know, the, the parade and parade itself, then and now, is there has there been much change? Is it Oh my is, god. Yeah. Oh my god. You said something very telling. It was a march then. It's a parade now. now you might exactly, as well be going yeah. to the Macy's parade. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> With the a float. Come on. Floats? Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> People are fighting for their lives. People are still fighting HIV. Transgender people are being murdered at alarming rates. And you have a goddamn float? Give me a break. They were marches. They were protests. It wasn't until a couple of years. I happened. I was in my mid-teens. But I went to that very first parade. I shouldn't say parade. I went to that very first march. And it ended in Central Park with a rally. Now it's a dance. Now it's corporate sponsorships. Mm -hmm. Now it's floats and colors. And I'm not saying you shouldn't have the colors. You want to dress however you dress. But we're still, we need now to be fighting for Black Lives Matter. We need to be fighting for the people of color communities within the LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. We need to be fighting for transgender. 
because they are being murdered at an astonishing rate in the United States and nobody seems to give a shit. And people of color that are transgendered are at the bottom of the barrel that are yeah. getting the worst of it all. And I don't see anybody doing a march. They do parades, but they don't do marches. We need to get back to our roots until mm -hmm. all of this has been settled. I agree. Right you on. You mentioned, like, I could not have segued that if I planned. The most affected people right now are people of color, trans youth. If you could give them a piece of advice. What yeah, to, any, to anybody flourishing now, you know, finding, finding their identity, any words of love and advice for them? You know, I'm the it gets better movement. I was never a part of that because sometimes it doesn't get better for a long time. You know, to say, oh, you know, I came out of the closet and three years later, here I am married with a dog and a picket fence. No, that's not always the case. That may have happened to you, but that's not for everybody. And trans people go through hell while they're transitioning. So to say in two or three years, you're going to be like me? No, they have to go through countless appointments. They have to go to a psychiatrist for several years. Then they have to start hormones. Their body has to change before they go through the gender affirmation surgery. So to say to them in a little bit, a little while, it's going to be fine. It's not going to be fine. Some of them are going to have to struggle their whole life because the families won't accept them. But what I can tell you is there is a community out there you need to find the people who have a like-minded opinion. Don't search out people that are going to put you down. Go to the people that are going to elevate you. Don't go to the people that are going to stomp on you. Go to the people that will lift you up because that's what you need. That's what we all need. But it's harder if you're a trans person coming out, if you're a trans person in the middle of taking hormones, if you're a trans person deciding whether or not to have surgery, if you're a trans person dating someone and you're not sure, should I tell them I'm transitioning? These are all things that you need help with. And it's okay to need help. It's okay to look for it, but look for it in the right places. Now, I don't know much about Canada. So maybe my hosts can give you more information on that because I can't help you with Canada. But what I would tell you is that look for people who are like you. Look for people who love you. Look for people who have a kind word and goodness to share with you. Don't look for the bad. There's enough of that out there. You don't even have to look for it. It'll come to you all on its own. Look for the goodness that's out there. It's there, man. It's there. You just have to look for it. Just like I call it going to, go to the store. It's like going to the store looking for a, that special pair of pants. Or if you're a trans person, a woman, that special dress mm -hmm. or that special skirt or that special bra or for a guy, that special jockstrap. You know that when you put it on, you go, oh my God, this is it. It's the same with people. We have to fit with each other. And we're not going to all fit together. And you know what? That's okay. Not yeah. everybody's going to accept you and that's okay. But there will be people that accept you. Look for those people. They're there. On that note, here in our city, we have plenty of resources and you will find them in the description of this video on all platforms we post this video. Dr. James, thank you so much for coming on the show yeah. with us. Honor and pleasure having you. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a joy and a privilege. This is probably the best thing that's come out of TikTok for me. Right on. <laughs> um, this episode goes out on the 52nd anniversary of the Stonewall Riot. Awesome. And I came out a year later, year one, I came out. Mazel tov. Congratulations on that, man. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And I'm still here, damn it. And I'm not That's going right. Anywhere. That's we right. And I hope you it was uh, uh, Yeah, I hope you're no, everlasting after that too, man. Thank you. We thought it and was you, no better it, day, more fitting to put this episode out. Well, I wish everyone in Canada across the country a wonderful pride. Remember those people who don't have the privilege you have. March for them, protest for them. We are not there yet. We cannot have a parade till everyone is equal. And Black Lives Matter. We need to help our Black community in the LGBT group. We need to help our trans community in the LGBT group. And we especially need to help our people of color that are trans because what's being done to them is a massacre. Yeah, thank you. You, you know, you got a beautiful soul, man. Uh, you know, keep, it, keep the fight going, please. Absolutely. I'm not going anywhere. Right on. Absolutely. With that in mind, to be continued. Thanks for tuning in. If you like this video, go ahead and button mash a thumbs up. If you want to swing by when we have a new video, web up the sub button. Oh, and while you're at it, hit the bell to be notified. Bye. Come on, go!